it is time for chapter 24. We are moving along in our book. We only have this much left. It is the end of the summer and um, we are fast approaching the time when Jem got his arm broken or he broke his arm. Somehow his arm got broken. Broken so badly that it is kind of disfigured and a little bit twisted, um, even now that he is older. So we're going to find out what happened, but not in chapter 24. In chapter 24, we move along as the town moves on after the trial, and we find out what is going on. It's, Attica seems pretty positive that Tom has a good chance for an acquittal, and um, at least to have a, um, a, a an appeal of his case. So we're going to find out what happened. I am starting on page 305, chapter 24. Calpurnia wore her stiffest, starchest apron. She carried a tray of Charlotte. She backed up to the swinging door and pressed gently. I admired the ease and grace with which she handled heavy loads of dainty things. So did Aunt Alexandra, I guess, because she'd let Calpurnia serve today. August was on the brink of September. Dill would be leaving for Meridian tomorrow. Today, he was off with Jim at Baker's Barker's Eating. Jim had discovered with angry amazement that nobody ever bothered to teach Dill how to swim, a skill Jim considered necessary as walking. They'd spent two afternoons at the creek. They said that they were going in naked, and I couldn't come. So I divided the lonely hours between Calpurnia and Miss Molly. Today, Aunt Alexandra had her missionary circle, where, and her missionary circle were fighting the good fight all over the house. From the kitchen, I heard Mrs. Grace Merriweather giving a report in the living room on the squalid lives of the Muraners. It sounded like to me. They put the women out in huts when their time came, whatever that was, and they had no sense of family. I knew that distressed Annie, Auntie. They subjected children to terrible ordeals when they were 13. They were crawling with yawls and earworms, and they chewed up and spat out the bark of a tree into a communal pot, and men got drunk on Immediately thereafter, the ladies adjourned for, fre for refreshments. I didn't know whether to go into the dining room or stay out. Aunt Alexandra told me to join them for refreshments. It was not necessary that I attend the business part of the meeting. She said it bore me. I was wearing my pink Sunday dress, shoes, and a petticoat, and reflected that if I spilled anything, Calpurnia would have to wash my dress again tomorrow. This had been a busy day for her, so I decided to stay out. Well, can I help, Cal? I asked, wishing to be of some service. Calpurnia paused in the doorway. You be still as a mouse in that corner, she said, and you can help me load up the trays when I come back. The gentle hum of ladies' voices grew louder as she opened the door. Why, Alexandra, I never saw such Charlotte. Oh, just lovely. I never can get my crust like this. I never can. Who'd have thought of little dewberry tots? Calpurnia? Yeah, who'd have thought it? Anybody tell you that the preacher's wife? No. Well, she is. And that one, other one, not walking yet. They became quiet, and I knew that they'd all been served. Calpurnia returned to put my mother's heavy silver pitcher on a tray. This coffee pitcher is a curiosity, she murmured. They don't make them like these these days. Can I carry it in? If you be careful and don't drop it, set it down at the end of the table by Miss Alexandra. Down there by the cups and things. She's going to pull. I tried pressing my butt against the door as Calpurnia had done, but the door didn't budge. Grinning, she held it up for me. Careful now, it's heavy. Don't look at it and you won't spill it. My journey was successful. Aunt Alexandra smiled brilliantly. Well, stay with us, Jean Louise, she said. This was a part of her campaign to teach me to be a lady. It was customary for every circle hostess to invite her neighbors in for refreshments, be they Baptists or Presbyterians, which accounted for the presence of Miss Rachel, 
somber as a judge, Miss Maudie, and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Rather nervous, I took a seat beside Miss Maudie and wondered why ladies put on their hats to go across the street. Ladies in bunches always filled me with vague apprehension and a firm desire to be elsewhere. But this feeling was what Aunt Alexandra called being spoiled. Ladies were cool and fragile pastel prints. Most of them were heavy powered, powdered, but unrouged. The only lipstick in the room was tangy natural. Q-Tex natural sparkled on their fingernails, but none of the younger ladies wore robes, and they smelled heavenly. I sat quietly, having conquered my hands by tightly gripping the arms of the chair, and waited for someone to speak to me. Miss Maudie's gold bridge work twinkled. Well, you're mighty dressed up, Miss Jean Louise, she said. And uh, where are your britches today? Under my dress. I hadn't meant it to be funny, but the ladies laughed. My cheeks grew hot as I realized my mistake. But Miss Maudie looked gravely down at me. She never laughed at me unless I meant to be funny. In the sudden silence that followed, Miss Stephanie Crawford called from across the room. Oh, what you doing? What you gonna be when you grow up, Jean Louise? A lawyer? No, I hadn't thought about it, I answered, grateful that Miss Stephanie was kind enough to change the subject. Hurriedly, I began choosing my vocation. Nurse? Aviator? Well, why shoot, I thought. You wanted to be a lawyer. You'd always commence to go into court. The ladies laughed again. That Stephanie's a card, somebody said. Miss Stephanie was encouraged to pursue the subject. Well, don't you want to grow up to be a lawyer? Miss Marty's hand touched mine, and I answered mildly enough. No, just a lady. Miss Stephanie eyed me suspiciously, suspiciously decided that I meant no impertinence and contended herself with, well, you won't get very far until you start wearing dresses more often. Miss Marty's hand closed tightly on mine, and I said nothing. Its warmth was enough. Mrs. Grace Merriweather sat on my left, and I felt it would be polite to talk to her. Mr. Merriweather, a faithful Methodist under duress, apparently saw nothing personal in singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saves the Wretch with Me. It was the general opinion of Maycomb, however, that Mrs. Merriweather had sobered him up and made a reasonable and useful citizen of him. For certainly Mrs. Merriweather was the most devout lady in Maycomb. I searched for a topic of interest to her. What did you all study this afternoon? I asked. Oh, child, those poor Marana's, she said, and was off. Few other questions would be necessary. Mrs. Merriweather's large brown eyes always filled with tears when she considered the oppressed. Living in that jungle with nobody but J. Grimes Everett, she said. Not a white person will go near him but that saintly James Grimes Everett. Miss Merriweather played her voice like an organ. Every word she said received its full measure. The poverty, oh, the darkness, the immorality, nobody but J. Everett Grimes knows. You know, when the church gave me that trip to the church grounds, J. Grimes Everett said to me, was he here, there, ma'am? I thought, home on leave. J. Grimes Everett said to me, he said, Mrs. Merriweather, you have no conception, no conception of what we are fighting over there. And that's what he said to me. Yes, ma'am. I said to him, Mr. Everett, I said, the ladies of the Maycomb, Alabama Methodist Episcopal Church South are behind you 100%. And that's what I said to him. And you know, right then and there, I made a pledge of my heart. I said to myself, when I go home, I'm going to give a course on the Maranas and bring J. Everett Grimes' meshes to Maycomb, and that's just what I'm doing. Yes, ma'am. When Mrs. Merriweather shook her head, her black curls jiggled. Jean Louise, she said, you are a fortunate girl. You live in a Christian home with Christian folks in a Christian town. Out there in J.F. Grimes Everett's land, there's nothing but sin and squalor. Yes, ma'am, sin and squalor. 
What was that, Gertrude? Mrs. Merriweather turned on her charms for the lady sitting beside her. Oh, that will. I always say, forgive and forget, forgive and forget. Things that church ought to do is help her lead a Christian life for those children from here on out. Some of the men ought to go out there and tell that preacher to encourage her. Excuse me, Mrs. Merriweather. Are you all talking about Mayella Ewell? May oh, no, child. That that's Darkie's wife, Tom's wife, Tom a Robinson man. Mrs. Ware Merriweather turned back to her neighbor. There's one thing I truly believe, Gertrude, she continued, that some people just don't see it my way. If we just let them know we forgive them, that we have forgiven it, then this whole thing will just blow over. Oh, uh, Miss Mer Mer Merriweather, I interrupted once more. Oh, what'll blow over? Again, she turned to me. Mrs. Merriweather was one of those childless adults who find it necessary to assume a different tone of voice when speaking to children. Oh, nothing, Jean Louise, she said in stately Largo. The cooks and field hands are just dissatisfied at their settling, but they're settling down. Now they grumbled all next day after the trial. Mrs. Merriweather faced Mrs. Farrow. Gertrude, I tell you, there's nothing more distracting than Miss Sulky Darky. The mouths go down in here. Just ruins your day to have one of them in the kitchen. You know what I got said to my Sophie, Gertrude? I said, Sophie, I said, you simply are not being a Christian today. Jesus Christ never went around grumbling and complaining. And you know it. You know it did her good. She took her eyes off that ground and said, no, ma'am. Miss Wareweather, Jesus never went around grumbling. I tell you, Gertrude, you just never ought to let an opportunity go by to witness for the Lord. I was reminded of the ancient little organ in the chapel at Finch Landing when I was very little, and if I had been very good during the day, Atticus would let me pump its bellows while he picked out a tune with one finger. And the last note would linger as long as there was air to sustain it. Mrs. Merriweather had run out of air, I judged, and was replenishing her supply when Mrs. Farrell composed herself to speak. Mrs. Farrell was a splendidly built woman with pale eyes and narrow feet, and she had a fresh permanent wave, and her hair was a mass of tight gray ringlets. She was the second most devout lady in Macon. She had a curious habit of prefacing everything she said with a soft, syllabic sound. Scrape, she said. It's just like I was telling Brother Hudson the other day. It's Brother Hudson, I said. Looks like we're fighting a losing battle. A losing battle, I said. It doesn't matter to me one bit. Not to them. We can educate them till we're blue in the face. We can try till we drop to make Christians out of them, but there's no lady saving a bed these nights. And he said to me, Mrs. Farrow, I don't know what we're coming down to here. So I told him that was certainly a fact. Mrs. Merriweather nodded wisely. Her voice soared over the clink of coffee cups, and the soft bovine sounds of the ladies munching their dainties. Gertrude, she said, I tell you, there are some good, some misguided people in this town. Good? misguided and folks in this town who think they're doing right i mean now far be it from me to say who but some of them in this town thought they were doing the right thing a while back but but all they did was stir them up that's all they did might have looked like the right thing to do at the time i'm sure i don't know i'm not read in that field but sulky satisfied I I tell you, if my Sophie kept it up another day, I'd have let her go. I'd have entered that wool of horrors at, that the only reason I keep her is because it's depression's on, and she needs her dollar and a quarter every week she can get it. His food doesn't stick da going down, does it? Miss Marty said it. Two tight lines had appeared at the corner of her mouth. She'd been sitting silently beside me, her coffee cup balanced on one knee, and I uh, had lost the thread of conversation long ago when they quit talking about Tom Robbins' wife and the contented myself 
were thinking of Finch Landing and the river. Aunt Alexandra had got it backwards. The business part of the meeting was blood curtainland. The social hour was dreary. Maudie, I'm sure I don't know what you mean, said Mrs. Merriweather. And I'm sure you do, Miss Maudie said shortly. And she said no more. When Miss Maudie was angry, her brevity was ass. Something had made her deeply angry, and her gray eyes were as cold as her voice. And Miss Merriweather reddened, glanced at me, and looked away. I could not see Mrs. Farrow. Aunt Alexandra got up from the table and swiftly passed more refreshments, neatly engaging Mrs. Merriweather and Mrs. Gates in brisk conversation. When she had him well on the road with Mrs. Perkins, Aunt Alexandra stepped back. She gave Miss Maudie a look of pure gratitude, and, and I wondered at the world of women. Miss Maudie and Aunt Alexandra had never been especially close. It was Auntie silently thanking her for something, for what I knew not. I was content to learn that Aunt Alexandra could be pierced sufficiently to feel gratitude for help given. Well, there was no doubt about it. I must soon enter this world where on this uh, surface fragrant ladies rock soft, slowly, fan gently, and drank cool water. But I was more at home on my, in my daddy's world. People like Mr. Hectic did not trap you with innocent questions and make fun of you. Even Jem had not highly criticized unless you said something stupid. Ladies seemed to live in faint horror of men, seemed unwilling to approve wholeheartedly of it, but I liked them. There was not something about them, no matter how much they cussed and drank and gambled and chewed, no matter how undelectable they were, there was something about them that I instinctively liked, and they weren't hypocrites mrs perkins born hypocrites mrs merriweather was saying at least we don't have that sin on our shoulders down here people up there set em free but you don't see em setting at the table with em at least we don't have the, the deceit to sit to say to em yes you're as good as we are but stay away from us down here we just say you live your way and we live ours i think that women that Mrs. Roosevelt, she lost her mind. She just lost her mind coming down to Birmingham and trying to sit with them. If I was the mayor of Birmingham, I'd... Well, neither of us was the mayor of Birmingham, but I wish I was the governor of Alabama for one day. I'd let Tom Robinson go so quick the missionary society wouldn't have time to catch his breath. Calpurnia was telling Miss Rachel's cook the other day how bad Tom was taking things, and she didn't stop talking when I came in the kitchen. She said there wasn't a thing Atticus could do to make uh, being shut up any easier for him, and that the last thing he said to Atticus before they took him down to the prison camp was, Bye, Mr. Finch. There ain't nothing you can do now, so there ain't no use trying. Calpurnia said Atticus told her that the day they took Tom to prison, he just gave up hope. She said Atticus tried to explain things to him, and that he must be, uh, he must do his best to not lose hope because Atticus was doing his best to get him free. Miss Rachel's cook said Calpurnia, as Calpurnia, why didn't Atticus just say, yes, you'll go free and leave it at that? Seemed like that'd be a big comfort at Tom. Calpurnia said, because you ain't familiar with the law, first thing you learn when you're in a law family is that there ain't any definite answer to anything. Mr. Finch couldn't say something so when he doesn't know for sure it's so. The front door slammed and I heard Atticus's footsteps in the hall. Automatically I wondered what time it was. Not nearly time for him to be home. And on missionary society days he, society days, he usually stayed downtown until black dark. He stopped in the doorway, his hat in his hand, and his face was white. Excuse me, ladies, he said. Go right ahead with your meeting. No, let me disturb you. Alexandra, could you come in the kitchen a minute? I want to borrow Calpurnia for a while. He didn't go through the dining room, but he went down the back hall and entered the kitchen from the rear door. Aunt Alexandra and I met him. The dining room door had opened again, and Aunt Maudie joined us. Calpurnia had half risen from her chair. Cal, Atticus said, I... I want you to go with me to Helen Robinson's house. 
But what's the matter? Aunt Alexandra asked, alarmed by the look on my father's face. Tom's dead. Aunt Alexandra put her hands to her mouth. They shot him, said Atticus. He was running. It was during their exercise period. They said he just broke into a blind raven charge at the fence and started climbing over right in front of them. Well, didn't they try to stop him? Didn't they, they give him any warning? Aunt Alexandra's voice shook. Oh, yes. The guards called to him to stop. They fired a few shots in the air, then to kill him. They shot him just as he went over the fence. They said if he had two good arms, he'd have made it. He was moving that fast. Seventeen bullet holes in him. They didn't have to shoot him that much. Okay, I want you to come out with me. Help me with tell Helen. Yes, sir, she murmured, fumbled at her apron. Miss Maudie went to Calpurnia and untied it. This is the last straw, Atticus, Aunt Alexandra said. Depends on how you look at it, he said. But was one Negro, more or less, among two hundred of them? It wasn't time to them. He was a, an escape in prison. Atticus leaned against the refrigerator, pushed up his glasses, rubbed his eyes. Oh, we had such a good chance, he said. I told him what I thought, but I couldn't in truth say that we had more than a good chance. I guess Tom was tired of white man's chances and for to take his own. Ready, Cal? Yes, sir, Miss Finch. Let's go. Aunt Alexandra sat down in Calpurnia's chair and put her hands on her face. She sat quite still. She was so quiet, I wondered if she would faint. I heard Miss Maudie breathing as if she had just climbed the stairs. In the dining room, the ladies chattered happily. I thought Aunt Alexandra was crying, but when she took her hands away from her face, she was not. But she looked weary. She spoke, and her face, her voice was flat. I can't say I approve of everything he does, Maudie, but he is my brother. And I just want to know when this will ever end. Her voice rose. It tears him to pieces. He doesn't show it much, but it tears him to pieces. I've seen him when. And what else do they want from him, Marty? What else? What does who want, Alexandra? Miss Marty asked. I mean, this time. Well, they're perfectly willing to let him do what they're afraid to do themselves. It might lose him a nickel. And they're perfectly willing to let him wreck his health doing what they're afraid to do. They're, they'll be quiet. They'll hear you, Miss Maudie said. Have you ever thought of it this way, Alexandra? Whether Maycomb knows it or not, we're paying the highest tribute we can a man. We trust him to do right. It's that simple. Who? Aunt Alexandra never knew she was echoing her 12-year-old nep nephew. The handful of people in this town who say that fair play is not mocked white only. The handful of people who say a fair trial is for everybody, not just us. The handful of people with enough humility to think when they look at a Negro, they're but for the Lord's kindness and mine. Miss Marty's old Christmas was, crispness was returning. The handful of people in this town with background, that's who they are. Had I been attentive, I would have had another scrap to add to Jim's definition of background. But I found myself shaken and I couldn't stop. I'd seen Enfield Prison Farm and Atticus had pointed out the exercise yard to me. It was the size of a football field. Stop that shaking, commanded Miss Marty, and I stopped. Get up, Alexandra. We've left him long enough. Aunt Alexandra rose and smoothed the various whalebone ridges along her hips. She took her handkerchief from her belt and she wiped her nose. She patted her hair and she said, Do I show it? Not a sign, said Miss Marty. Are you together again, Jean Louise? Yes, ma'am. Then let's join the ladies, she said grimly. Their voices swelled when Miss Marty opened the dining room door. Aunt Alexandra was ahead of me and I saw her head go up as she went through the door. Oh, Miss Perkins, she said, you need some more coffee? Let me get it. 
Calpurnia's on an errand for a few minutes, Grace, said Miss Maudie. Let me pass you some more of those dewberry tarts. Do you hear what that cousin of mine did the other day, the one who likes to go fishing? So they went, down the row of laughing women, around the dining room, refilling coffee cups, dishing out goodies, as though their only regret was the temporary domestic disaster of losing Calpurnia. The gentle hum again. Oh, yes, sir, Mrs. Perkins, that J. Graham Everett is a martyred saint. He needed to get married, so they ran to the beauty parlor every Saturday afternoon. Soon as the sun goes down, he goes to bed with the, oh, the chickens, a crate full of sick chickens. Fred said that's what started it all. Fred says. Aunt Alexandra looked across the room at me and smiled. She looked at a tray of cookies on the table and nodded at them. I carefully picked up the tray and walked myself to Miss Merriweather, and with my best company manners, I asked if she would have some. I mean, after all, if Auntie could be a lady at a time like this, so could I. Ah, 